It's hard to believe. We've only got one more week of February. It's going to be March. It's hard to believe we've been looking at these I am statements of Jesus now. This is our sixth week and we only have one more to go. Thinking about our scripture for today. Seems a little amazing to me sometimes. A little surprising to me sometimes that maybe it shouldn't. I'm sure you probably recognize it too. For a country that still at least sort of says that we are a Christian nation, we can be a very, very superstitious bunch, can't we? We can be a very superstitious bunch sometimes. Forget about the nation that calls itself Christian. Think about us who truly do believe in Jesus Christ, who, who being a part of that body is important. We can be a very superstitious bunch sometimes. Someone dies and people are sad, right? Then someone else dies and people start wondering, and I've seen it here, I've heard it here. You, see, you get two people that die and then what? People start saying, oh gee whiz, I wonder who's next. Yeah, Dennis is flashing me, it's not a gang sign, the three, three there. You know, we, we, we hear that, okay, it happens in threes, right? These things happen in threes, right? And I, I, I don't actually believe that that happens in threes. I think you can find twos and sevens and, and well, last year we had 11 of our brothers and sisters in Christ here from rules that passed away and passed into the church triumphant. Uh, but, but there is kind of that thought out there that these kind of things happen in threes. People think that bad things happen in threes. And so there's one bad thing, here's another, and oh boy, what's next? And we start living on edge. But then there's some people that have a real positive, positive outlook on life. Oh, no, no, no. Good things happen in threes. Good things come in threes, right? Maybe, maybe it's, it's both. Maybe we're not quite as superstitious as what we think we are, and we're just obsessed with threes. If you're up on such things here, the phenomenon of three, we find threes all over the place that we pay attention to and that seem to be important and relevant. For those of you who are hip and you are, you are into this kind of thing, if you are, if you are aware of such things here, uh, basic element of design, three, can be very, very important. Practitioners there of the ancient Asian notion of feng shui just know how, just how important that is. When you're designing your house, when you're decorating, three, Three pictures or three candles arranged or three items or just the right position, the right, the right arrangement of chair and table and lamp. There's a certain harmony about that. Three is so important, right? Threes are, that's just not a design thing. We are obsessed with threes in, in lots of places. Threes, uh, we love threes in storytelling. The Three Musketeers, one of my favorite stories, one of my favorite movies growing up. The Three Musketeers, one for all and all for one. Or, or maybe some of you are a, a little different end of the spectrum in your entertainment. And it's the Three Amigos, hey! You know, that kind of thing. Or, I, I, I wonder here how many... How many as kids at least, and we won't go past that, but how many of you as kids at least didn't hear about and think about and, and wish for that genie's lamp with your, your three wishes? Ever, ever spend a little conversation over the lunch table or recess or some, some place and you're thinking, what would I do with three wishes? Oh, the first thing I'd do is wish for unlimited. No. How many have played that game there? Threes and stories, uh, lots, of, lots of fun. But sometimes, sometimes it's not all about fun. Sometimes, sometimes there's a, a negative flip side, you know. Sometimes three's a crowd. <laughs> you don't want three musketeers or three amigos when you've got one young lady and one young man and they're planning a special evening. That third one can really feel out of place, right? Uh, three is definitely a crowd in that circumstance. And there are plenty of times when it, if we're dealing with three of something, trying to keep thra track of, of three of something, it, it can feel like an absolute chore. If you are trying to keep track of three different subjects in school maybe. Oh, which one is due tomorrow? Where's the homework? Or when's the test? Or keeping track of three different medications and sometimes they all look alike, right? You spill those doggone pills and which one's which? Which one was supper and which one was breakfast? Or keeping track of three different appointments. Sometimes when you're trying to keep track of three or when three is, is in your head and your brain and your life, it, it feels like you're juggling. It feels like you're juggling, right? And that can get a little uncomfortable sometimes. 
Have any of you here, do, do, does anybody here know how to juggle? Does anybody here know how to juggle? Seth, Seth, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting a direction here. Seth, come up front now. <laughs> Years ago, when I was at a, a youth retreat, a youth conference in high school, I learned how to juggle. They, they, now, the conference, we had times of worship and speakers, and they had all different kinds of workshops for very spiritual and very serious things. But there were some fun ones, too. And so I took this fun one, how to juggle. There's a whole bunch of us got together, and there's this very ordinary-looking guy came out there. He says, I'm going to teach you how to juggle in five minutes. And we just all laughed at him. But he pretty much got the job done in five minutes. He told us what we needed to do, and we learned how to juggle in five minutes. Of course, perfecting it can take an awful lot more. But it's really a rather simple thing to learn how to juggle. So the trick is you just got to learn how to be consistent. You really got to learn how to be consistent. And take, take, just take a ball. Take one ball, put it in your hand, hold your other hand out here, and, and just go like that and learn to toss. And you want to toss it so that it goes from this hand and you catch it in this hand. And you want it so that you have a very consistent arc. You know, you don't want to have one that's like six foot high and one that's three inches. You, you want to learn how to toss it so it stays pretty consistent. Toss it from one hand to the next so you can catch it. And, and, and toss it back so you can catch it. And, and here's the thing so that it's consistent and you don't have to really look at it. You can do this without really looking. And once you got that, okay, take two balls and put one in this hand and one in this hand. Now, toss this one, and when this one gets up to about here and it's about ready to start to drop, then you got a ball here, right? You got to get rid of that. What do you do? Toss that one a while. It frees up this hand. This ball can drop in here and then catch this one over here. And you're on your way. Just keep doing that. Practice that back and forth until it gets consistent and you can do it without looking and really without thinking about it. Then here comes the real trick. Take three balls. But wait, I don't have three hands. Anybody here have three hands? <laughs> Anybody have three? No. Put two in the first hand. Toss one ball up, and when it gets up to about here, you toss this ball. That hand's empty. You can catch this one. This one's flying up here. Now it's coming down. Wait a minute, I got a ball here. Toss that. Guess what? You just started to juggle. And you keep practicing that again and again and again until you can do it consistently, until you can do it without looking. Just keep practicing it. And, and really, if you can be consistent, and if you're not interrupted, this often was the problem when I was trying to practice. You had a brother that came and stuck his arm in like that or something. You know, if you can keep doing that without interruption and keep it pretty consistent, guess what? You are juggling. And you can go on pretty much on and on forever and ever. As long as you don't mess up. Some people catch on to that very quickly. And there are indeed people who learned how to juggle in five minutes. Some of us took a little longer. Some of us took a whole lot longer than, than five minutes. But, you know, if you stick with it, it's the kind of thing that you can learn. Now, why do I say this? Because our text today really has us juggling. Our text today that we're going to look at, this, this sixth of Jesus I am statements really has us juggling. If we think back on our series, we started weeks ago with Jesus is the bread of life. And then we added to that, Jesus is the light of the world. And then we added a week after that, Jesus is the gate. Whoa, we're up to three balls already, right? But then there was Jesus is the good shepherd. And then last week we talked about, oh, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. We're at, there's two at once. Today, though, forget about one at a time. Today, when Jesus makes his statement that we're going to look at, we are definitely adding some complexity. Today, Jesus has us juggling because he tells us in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So here we go. We really, truly do have three things at one time. So what we want to do is take a look at this saying in its larger setting so that maybe we can make a little bit of sense about it and understand what's going on and try to keep these ideas all going at the same time. John, I'm going to read chapter 14, beginning of verse 1 to 14. John 14, 1 to 14. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? 
Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it's the Father living in me who's doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. So here we have a very, very busy text. This is a text that is, is extremely full of so many things, and we're going to focus. We're going to focus on Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. But truthfully, we could have several sermons. We could preach several sermons out of this text alone. If you look towards the end of that scripture, there, uh, in in verse. 12, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Think about that. Jack can do greater things than Jesus. Joanne can do greater things than Jesus because Jesus is going to the Father. That's certainly worth a look, isn't it? I would say so. And then there's the idea after that, Ask me anything that you will in my name, and, and, and I will do it. We could certainly spend some time, and we could pull a few sermons out of this passage. It's a very busy, busy passage that we have today at a very busy, busy time in Jesus' ministry. This is part of a conversation, a really teaching that Jesus has with his disciples in the upper room just hours before he is arrested. It's the night before his crucifixion. So it's an intense time. And I think to some degree, the disciples get that a little bit, but they, they don't have the full sense of just how intense this is going to be. Some of your Bibles, if you have your Bible open, some of your Bibles might have a heading at the beginning of the chapter there. Mine, mine has a heading at the beginning of the chapter here that says Jesus comforts his disciples. And he's comforting them because he's just had a very uncomfortable exchange with them where he tells them that he's going to be betrayed. He tells the disciples that he is going to be betrayed and then Judas leaves. And in the midst of all this chaos, we have Jesus telling Peter that Peter will deny Jesus three times. So these men are upset. Jesus begins then this, this portion of the teaching trying to comfort his disciples. He's got, got to get them to calm down a little bit if they're going to actually hear what he has to say, right? Right? But here they are. They're in Jerusalem. They're feeling vulnerable because of those who oppose Jesus. If we go back and we harmonize Gospels together, you, you get the sense other places that some of them weren't too crazy about coming in the first place. They might have rather have stayed up north in Galilee or something, or let's just go out and, and, and go to McDonald's or something. Like, no, not, not Jerusalem. That's a, they're after you there. So they're, they're, they're nervous, they're, they're, they're feeling vulnerable, and, and, and probably now they're feeling confused and maybe even a little guilty because Jesus has been telling them that he'd be betrayed and they're, they're all going to fall away. Even Peter is going to fall away? Jesus says then to comfort them, to get them to calm down a little bit. Verse 2, in my Father's house there are many rooms, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go, verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Just whew, put yourself in their shoes. Just 
Let that sink in for a moment. Oh, wow. That sounds good, doesn't it? Some place else than here. Anywhere else than here. Not just any place, though. Some place special. Some place special with Jesus. Sounds great, right? But wait, verse 4, Jesus continues, You know the way to the place where I am going. Record scratch. <laughs> Thomas, is, Thomas is calling time out here. Wait a minute, Jesus. Wait, wait, time out. Now, think, think about it here. If Peter has a reputation for wearing his heart on his sleeve, you know, for letting his emotions spill out like liquid crazy all over the place more than once, Thomas is the guy who has very little filter on his mouth, and whatever he's thinking tends to come out. In fact, Thomas doesn't just say whatever he's thinking. Thomas seems sometimes to say what everybody else is thinking as well. A number of times we see this in Thomas. And here he pops out, hey, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? I don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? I'll bet that there were some other disciples that were relieved that Thomas asked that question, right? Because then they didn't have to. <laughs> they didn't have to. I'm relieved that Thomas asked that question because of the answer that Jesus gives. Because this is where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And there we have it. Now with the disciples, we go from worried and maybe guilty, certainly confused, we go to juggling. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Not the way or the truth or the life. The way, the truth, and the life. So let's break it down here to understand a little bit. First, that Jesus is the way. The Greek word here for way is hodos. It literally means a road or a path or a street. Even it is used in, in places to talk about the route that a ship would take or the course of a stream. Now, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> Jesus is the road? How does that work? That doesn't make sense in a literal sense, but figuratively or metaphorically, this word is used to describe the way and the means to achieve something. So here, if Jesus is, is the way, what is the way for? If we look at this conversation, Jesus is the way and the means to achieve the place that he is prepared for us. He's been talking about this special place. He is the way. He is the means to get there. Okay? The way and the means to get there. You want to get where Jesus is preparing? You follow him. You, you follow him like you would follow a, a stream to, to, to a, it, 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 its source. You follow him like you would follow a road to your destination. You want to get to that destination? Follow Jesus. He is the way. He is the means. But Jesus isn't just the way. He is the truth. Here the Greek word is aletheia. Now in the Old Testament, I just want to back this up a little bit. In the Old Testament, the closest Hebrew word that we have is amin. And, and that refers to a reality. To, to say that something is the amin, the truth, it, it, it's a reality that's regard is firm. You can depend on it. It's solid. This is valid. Okay? It, it's binding. It's true in that sense. It, it, it's like physically, it's, it's true. It's binding. You bring that into the New Testament, and it's that, but we add some nuance to it. There's even more meaning that's added. In particular, in this passage here, it's not just that Jesus is, is firm and valid and true. They can hold on to him, and he is reliable, and he is solid in that way. But truth refers to the full or the real state of something, that there is nothing hidden. When we're seeing him, when we grasp him, there is nothing hidden. There is nothing that's held back. It is the full state. That's significant. Have you ever, I won't ask you to share this story, but you can just nod with your eyes instead of raising your hand, but have you ever been in a conversation, somebody asks you something, and you know the answer, but you don't necessarily want to tell them the whole answer. But you know it's not right to lie either. And so you just tell them part of it. 
the part of it that's convenient for you or the part of it that, that works for you or the part of it that doesn't get you in trouble. You haven't told a lie, but you haven't told the whole truth. Okay? This is what you need to kind of think of here when we talk about Jesus being the aletheia, the truth. It is the whole truth. Nothing is held back. You want to know what's real, what's true? You look at Jesus. It's the whole truth. You call him the whole truth here. Jesus is the whole truth. It, 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 the whole truth about what he teaches from God. Everything about God is revealed in him. That Jesus is, is the whole truth in plain view about God. There's nothing hidden. You look at him and you see it all. This is why following his statement... He says in verse 7, if, if you really knew me, you know the Father as well. From, from now on, you do know him and you've seen him. To look at Jesus and to, to, to get his teaching, to see his miracles and to understand is to see and to know and to understand God the Father. Philip jumps in here. Philip, we change characters, he's confused. Jesus says, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father. So Jesus is the way. He's the means by which we'll get to where the place is being prepared for us. But he is the truth. We see everything that's needed. There is nothing hidden in him to get to where it is that God wants us to be. But Jesus is not just the way and the truth. Jesus is the life. <coughs> the word for life here, the Greek word for life, there's a couple that are used in, in Greek in the Bible, in different places. The word here is zoe, and it's, it's a little bit of a tricky word. This is, this is not like referring to the most basic uh, just fact or existence of life. This isn't, this isn't like the, your, your friend, your loved one is in the ICU and hooked up to the monitors, and you're sitting there staring, watching to see if the little, the little beeps will go up and down. Is there a heartbeat? Is there brain activity? Is there breathing? It's, it's, not, it's not that there's signs of life in that way. Rather, this form of the word life has to do with the essence or the quality of life. It indicates that there is a vitality. Jesus, Jesus as the life means there's, there's a vitality about us and how we go about life. We should think about how Jesus said that he came that we might have life and have it to the full. What Jesus is describing here about himself, it's not just life going through the motions. It's not just ordinary existence, check another day off your calendar, What's on tap for tomorrow? Same old, same old. What's the day after that? Same old, same old. Rather, with Jesus, there's a special quality. There's a special vitality that is known only in him and through him. So wrap all of this up together in a neat little bow, if we can. And what do we have? Jesus here is reassuring his anxious disciples at what they probably think is their lowest. And we know it's not. They're going to have some even lower times in a little while. But they probably think this is as low as it can get. They're worried. They can't imagine it worse than this. And he is reassuring them that he is all that they need. You're going through a tough time. I'm all that you need. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. If they have him, they're secure. And they have a very special place with God. No matter what's going on, no matter what might happen, and no matter where they are, they have a special place with God because he is the way, the truth, and life. What they need is him. What they need is him to get there to where it is God wants them to be. Whether it's a real place, literally, or whether it's more of a spiritual place, what they need to get where God wants them to be, where it's special between them and God, is, is Jesus. You can only get there through Jesus the way. You can only get there on Jesus' terms, the truth, and you can only get there by sharing, experiencing, or being fueled by his vitality, his life. There's no other way. It's an act of juggling, if you will. Because to get to where Jesus is preparing a place, to get to that state that Jesus is preparing, you need all three. You can't substitute and you can't change anything about who Jesus is or what Jesus does to get where Jesus wants you to be. I thought of another way to look at this. 
How many here avail yourselves of social media and are maybe a little bit familiar with Twitter? Come on. I had one that went like this in the first service. <laughs> wow. Okay. Have you heard of Twitter? <laughs> for, those, for those that avail yourselves of Twitter, you're aware that it, it, it's, a, it's a, a way of having a, a conversation in a much bigger way. You don't have to be limited to, like, Dave and I, let's have a little chat here. The rest of you just take five minutes and we're going to talk about it. No. You can have a conversation with people all over the world. You can have a conversation with people you have no idea who they were or who they are. But if there's something on your mind you want to chat about, something on your mind you want to jump in, you can. The, the thing that makes it work, you just you have to be aware of the, the, the little protocol to follow. If you follow correctly, you can you can be a part of and follow big conversations. The key there is 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 you start you, you, you post your little thought, whatever that might be, and, and you then follow it up with hashtag or to those who are not familiar, it's a number sign there. Hashtag, and then some little phrase or word that will identify. So let's say, for instance, let's say, for instance, that, um, you know, the other week the, the Oscars are on and Jack is a stark, raving, uh, just fanatic for all things entertainment and, and he wants to follow, he wants to follow what's going on with all those movies and stuff and so he's sitting there watching the Oscars with his smartphone and, and he gets in on the hashtag Oscars and he goes, oh, that last, uh, that was crazy, they should have never gave that and he posts his little thing, hashtag Oscars and he can see who else agrees with him and who else thinks that he's crazy and, and it's that kind of thing. Or, or maybe a couple weeks ago, there certainly were folks that, that were watching the, the so-called Super Bowl, um, that, that game there that was the last game of the season. You remember that one there? Um, and, and, and they're following along, and as they're following along, they're, they're on Twitter, and it hashtag Super Bowl. Here's the thing. Even if you, even if you, you don't want to comment, you can be like a cyber stalker. You can just like listen in on conversations. You just, you, the thing is you got to follow the protocol. You know, I want to follow what's going on, the conversation about the Super Bowl. So I get on my phone and, and open it up and hashtag Super Bowl. But you, you got to be exact. You got to be precise. If you wanted to follow along what was happening and what people were saying about the Super Bowl, you, you type in hashtag S-U-P-E-R-B-O-W-L. If you accidentally type in hashtag S-U-P-P-E-R-B-O-W-L, Supper Bowl, you're going to go to a very different place in a very, very, very different conversation. The same principle is true when it comes to faith. If you want to end up where Jesus is promising, you have to do it Jesus' way. Hashtag way, truth, life. No substitutes. You change one of those components and you're left out in the dark. Hashtag way life doesn't get you there. Hashtag truth way doesn't get there. You need all three components. It does no good to pray for the life that God intends for you, that Jesus desires for you to have, that he died for you to have. And, and, and you can even recognize that he is the way, but if you substitute your own truth, you're never going to get where God wants you to be and where Jesus died for you to be. You can have all the truth in the world, all of it really, but if it only stays in your head and you will not follow, you will not do, you will not live it out, you're not going to get where God wants you to be and where Jesus died for you to be able to be. You get the idea. The crux of the matter is we, we, live, we live in a time and a place that are far removed, thousands of years removed from the disciples when Jesus first spoke these words. Our society looks so very different today than theirs did, and yet there's not one single person today who doesn't need exactly what it is that Jesus was talking to the disciples about. They needed reassured about what God had in mind and what Jesus was preparing for them, and every single one of us needs assured and reminded of what Jesus did back then because he did it for us too. There are a lot of people today who think that they're really, really living life. Oh boy, I've got it. Look at my house and my car and new this and shiny that and here's the vacation we got planned. They think they're living life, but if you're doing it on your own, if you're doing it your own way, you're fooling yourself. 
You might even have goals. You think, boy, I'm going someplace. I've got good things ahead of me. I'm on track. I'm checking off my checklist, and I'm, I'm heading somewhere. But if the path that you are on leads anywhere else than where Jesus' path leads, you're setting yourself up for an eternal tragedy. And likely you're going to have more downs and ups along the way in this life too. You know, sometimes I talk to people, people of faith, brothers and sisters in Christ, church folks, and they just feel like they're, they're, they're doing nothing but juggling. I mean, the life is so full. Things are swirling around and whirling around in their brain, their mind, their heart with relationships and work. They feel like they're, they're, they're just juggling like mad to try to be faithful. But here's the thing. God is patient with our efforts. God is patient with our efforts. And if we, if we will get in the conversation, hashtag way truth life, and stay there, you'll find you're on the right track. You're on the right track. And you stay in that conversation. You stay in God's word. You stay connected to him in prayer. You stay connected with brothers and sisters in Christ for encouragement. You stay connected trying to be faithful and, and living out your, your faith and obedience. You're going to find that God stacks things in favor of those who want to find him and to know him. But that's a sermon for another day too. For now, for now, I want you to concentrate on your juggling. Concentrate on your juggling. Work on getting that down. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. If you can get that on track, and if you can get that down, Jesus is preparing a place for you. He's going ahead. And if he's prepared a place... He's going to bring you to him. And that's a pretty amazing thing, a pretty assuring thing at a time like now. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Amen.